Welcome to my Season 2 Dragonflight Underwrought Masterclass Guide. And in today's guide, I will make sure that you understand and learn everything you need to know in order to time both tyrannical and fortified keys on Underwrought. So let me explain the first pool here, just rewinding the footage a little. So when you first start off the dungeon, in the traditional way, we used to only pull the matron together with the maggot, which is basically these two mobs together. The reason is because when the ticks in this dungeon, when they die, they basically do a burst of damage that on fortified keys is going to be really, really dangerous. But on this 18 underrod here, we can still manage with the ticks damage. Whenever they die, they do something called blood burst. And ideally, you don't want to kill them all at the same time because if everything explodes at the same time, healer can't deal with the damage. Now let's talk about the matron and the maganix and you can see I'm pulling them all together. But I'm just telling you, if you can't cope with the tick damage, to separate the ticks with the matron and maggot pull. So the matron and maggot, let's see what the matron does. The matron charges out to the range player here and does instant damage, right? Immediate damage. And he follows up with an ability called the Savage Cleave. Now take note of Savage Cleave here. It's a frontal here and he's winding up. You can see Savage Cleave is going off. And if you are standing in the frontal of Savage Cleave, you actually end up taking a bleed, right? So this is a damage over time if you stand in front of the matron. That is why the matron is dangerous, but also the maggot is dangerous at the same time because the maggot does something called Rotten Bow. And this needs to be manually stopped. It cannot be interrupted as per normal, but you can stop the cast by a stun or CC, any form of CC really. So in this case, we basically, you know, we um, hodge the, the maggot. So you don't ever want the bow to go off because the bow actually does significant amounts of damage. And you can see we're ticking down here because of the ticks blood bursting and the pharaoh basically stopped the next rotten bow. Traditionally, you can also look at where the maggot is facing and that's where the frontal rotten bow will be. But in a very hectic situation in Underwater, and you can see later in this dungeon, it's very hard to see where it's facing. So it's always better to just stun the rotten bow. And you can see that the matron charged out again is doing his savage cleave thing. Um, so just always make sure that you kind of move out of it. The matron also does an ability called war cry. You can see war cry is going off here. War cry is a dispellable, is a suitable uh, buff. And it basically casts, uh, or rather it basically makes anyone buffed by war cry basically have a lot more haste. That's why the rotten bow is going through a lot faster this time around. And essentially you can dispel the war cry if you want. But, you know, in other cases, if it's manageable, you can just ignore it. You know, your Rotten Ball is about to go off. We stun it again. And the next pool here, this pool, let me talk about it. This pool is kind of dangerous. In the past, some people chose to also chain this together with the matron we just killed. Meaning you do the maggot together with the ticks. That's one way to open the dungeon. And then you can basically do the matron with these guys. But let me talk about why these guys are pretty dangerous. The headhunters. So the hit hunters has two abilities. They basically firstly net uh, one random player and it immobilizes them. And if you actually pull the matron in together with them, there's a chance the matron cleaves and you can't get out because you're being netted by the hit hunters. The hit hunter also does something where they throw random spears at people. And I'm just waiting for them to start casting here so I can talk about it. You can see they do this thing called hook snare, which is basically the net that will throw um, onto, let's say in this case, the druid. And the barb spear is a random, you know, aggro thing that they throw um, a spear at someone. And the spear actually does sizable amounts of damage on a fortified keys. So you need to be ready when the barb spear is on you on a fortified key to pop a defensive. It's kind of dangerous. The priest, on the other hand, does a blood bolt that is a um, single target cast that does damage. But this is not the most dangerous ability the priest can do. The priest can also cast something called the Gift of Guhun. And the Gift of Guhun, if it goes through, it's basically a buff that uh, will basically land on its, you know, one of the enemy mobs. You can see it's casting Gift of Guhun on one of the fanatical headhunters. If this cast goes through, it means that the buff on the headhunter, one of the headhunters, will prevent the headhunter from dying. So one way to get rid of the Gift of Guhun is something that can be dispelled. So if you fail to kick Gift of Kuhun, just make sure you know, you're dispelling um, the buff of Gift of Kuhun. And you can notice immediately after Gift of Kuhun, just rewinding the footage here, immediately after Gift of Kuhun, it attempted to cast something called Dark Reconstitution, which we were able to stop. 
Dark Reconstitution is essentially a heal on an enemy mob, and you don't ever want this to go through. So Gift of Guhun, Dark Reconstitution are the two dangerous abilities a priest will cast and make sure you stop them. Um, it's really, really important. So on Underrod, the next part of the dungeon is um, you know interesting. And before we head down the stairs, we actually clear off the ticks here. So remember, if you clear all the ticks together at one time, you will suffer blood burst from each of the ticks. And what that ends up happening is, you know, everyone takes heavy party damage. You can see everyone's taking very heavy party damage here. I basically had to spend um, some self use to keep myself alive. Now, the most important thing about Underrod next is this. Underrod has two of these paths that is leading down towards the first boss. And on each of the platforms, on the left and on the right, on certain weeks, the mobs here will spawn differently. And one of them will have the matron mobs, the ones that we talked about previously that charges out and does a cleave. And one of them will not, in this case, the right hand side. So the most important thing to note is that you want to invis past the platform here. So the one with the matron here obviously won't allow you to invis past. And I'll talk about why later. But you just need to know that you need to eyeball which is the platform without the matrons. And that's the path you want to clear towards too. So in this case, it's this path, right? So um, there'll always be this group of uh, three mobs patrolling this path, which is the priest, which we talked about, the matron that charges out and does the savage cleave that you need to dodge the frontal off. You can outrange it, by the way. Um, and the headhunter that randomly basically nets someone. And you can see he does the hook snare on one of my uh, druids here. That's why he's being netted. You can see this animation here. This effect here, he's being netted. Um, so imagine if the matron charges out to him and cleaves, he's kind of stuck, right? So that's why it's dangerous. Anyway, uh, the priest, you kick them, uh, watch out for the barbed spears, watch out for the frontal cleave from the matron, and you should be Gucci. But let's talk about you know the next part of the dungeon. And um, as you guys can see, once we clear out these mobs that's patrolling up and down the stairs, uh, we are now going to invis pot to the right hand side. And the reason again, because on the left hand side, the platform actually has matrons on that. And they basically will see um, stealth. So that's why you invis past this platform here because there's no matron and none of them can see stealth. So the reason why everyone, and I mean everyone, okay, even without a rogue, people always invis past of death run past these guys and have someone mass rest here, is really because this befouled spirit mob here, this mask dude here, he does a few dangerous abilities, actually two of them. The first is something that is uninterruptible. It's called Dark Omen. He will target someone and it's single target damage. However, if there's any players nearby the targeted player, they will take damage as well. So that's one reason why it's dangerous. The second reason is it casts a interruptible spell that is called Harrowing Despair. And this does massive AoE damage and it needs to be interrupted. However, at the same time, you also have a priest on this platform. And we talked about how dangerous this priest is, right? It can cast Gift of Guhun and it can cast the basically um, heal on the enemy mobs, both of which are very important cards. So you're just introducing additional complexities in a part where without voice comms, you are unable to kick them. That's why you always skip um, this platform. And also you have the headhunters that, you know, obviously they, they throw random spears at people that kind of hurt on fortified keys, by the way. Now we talk about the first boss, which is basically... Um, Lieksa. Lieksa is a very simple boss if your party understands the concept of interrupting the boss. Because all Lieksa does is cast a blood bolt. And we can talk about the abilities um, as you know the fight goes on. But you can see blood bolt being cast again and it will randomly jump to someone and try and cast Sanguine Feast. Do not stand near the boss when he's casting Sanguine Feast. It's an AoE damage around the boss. So just Keep a distance here. And then after Sanguine Feast, it would basically try and cast again. Followed by Creeping Rod. Creeping Rod is essentially a frontal where the boss is facing. So in this case, she's facing outwards. So Creeping Rod is going to travel in this direction. You can see this green wave here. It will travel outwards in this direction. Then it will cast Blood Mirror, which you can see on this faint circle here. It will summon a replica of the boss. And the replica of the boss has the same Blood Bolt Chain Spam cast that the boss will do. So the traditional strategy is you want to try and assign kicks 
on who to basically um you know um basically uh, interrupt which mob right and at the same time you need to dodge all the creeping rods and stuff and by the way um i kind of misspoke there earlier the ad that is being summoned can also cast uh creeping rods so just be very careful about that as well like you need to watch frontals from both sides and um at the same time you need to basically just kick the uh, blood bolts but as long as your party is savvy around firstly watching the frontals of where they are facing as well as kicking the um, interruptible blood bolts you should be relatively fine however on tyrannical keys these guys can be a problem if you run some form of range heavy uh, you know composition right so you have less kicks but just remember the blood bolt can be interrupted sorry can be reflected by a warrior as well so just something nifty to think about so anyway you have rods here um, that you traditionally pull sometimes um, I think in early days we used to pull the living rod back in BFA together with uh, some of the lashes and let me talk about the lashes here so the lashes have a very important cast that needs to be kicked um, and meanwhile the living rod will just spam cast wave of decay and if it goes through it basically just spawns a green swirly on the ground that is slowly gonna explode when a projectile lands so you can just let it go through it's not dangerous but the lasher is the one that you absolutely must kick. And we pulled a blood swarmer here. You guys can see this green swirly. That's from the living rod. And we're just letting it cast, right? It's not important. But you can see the lasher is about to do something important very shortly. It's casting Decaying Mine. Decaying Mine, if not interrupted, would basically stun one of your allies or party members for a really long time. And Decaying Mine is actually, I believe, a kick that can't be soloed by a melee DPS. It can be soloed by a shammy though, but a melee DPS cannot solo the lashes kick. Unless for the first decaying mine you kick, and then for the second decaying mine you stun or you CC, and then by the time it recasts, you can actually get your kick up. So just something to note, but lashes are important to kick. But that's not the most dangerous amongst all the mobs that we have pulled. The most dangerous is actually the Blood Swarmer. The Blood Swarmer actually does this ability where it fixates on someone and it does a lot of damage on fortified keys and you can see we let its sonic screech go off and I'll talk about why. You can see that it's fixating on this guy right with the eyes you can see uh, which is basically on the warrior and whenever he gets close to the warrior it does quite a bit of damage and that's why we are hodging the blood swarmer stopping it in its tracks stopping it from meleeing the fixated target. This is really really important because out of everything in this second area here that can wipe you the most dangerous one is definitely the blood swarmer and some people will even go to the extent of letting the blood swarmer channel its sonic screech because when it's doing its sonic screech it is unable to basically fixate on you and there's a trick with the blood swarmer sonic screech which you might see later on when we pull another blood swarmer and i'll talk about it later um so keep in mind that trick here but the next part that you can see that we are pulling here is um, basically a pack that has the maggots as well. So the maggot, same thing as the start of the dungeon, you can see Rotten Bile is being cast. It's a frontal and you want to make sure you stun it before it finishes its cast. It's really important because if you don't, on four or five keys, this frontal will basically one shot. Rotten Bile is going through again. You can see it's facing the other side. You manage to stun it in, in time. Um, but yeah, that's essentially the dangerous part right the rotten bowel needs to be stopped that's uh, the most critical part you can see there's two blood swarmers here you never ever want to pull two blood swarmers never ever on high for the fight it would instantly kill your key because these guys are insane so respect the blood swarmers um, in my case you know i think i chained them which i believe in BFA, what we used to do, and this is, you know, a mistake. I've not done it for a couple of years now. What we used to do, I think, is CC one of the Blood Swarmers, and then you pull the other one, right? Um, and basically, you kill one of them off first. So anyway, there's a trick with the Blood Swarmer. When they attempt to cast Sonic Screech, what you can do is you can actually not interrupt it, and you stun it, or you use some form of crowd control on them. Because by doing so, they would consistently try and recast sonic screech but while it's recasting and spamming sonic screech it's unable to fixate the guy that is targeted on so anyway this uh, blood swarmer does a physical damage on the target right so if it's something that 
um, is a problem, you can actually bop him or her, right? That's something that can actually really help against the Blood Swarmers. But any form of crowd control can basically stop them from doing whatever they want. But the most ideal way to kind of like keep them under control is you try and CC every time they do Sonic Screech and they'll keep trying to recast that. So a Druid can actually spam Hibernate on it. Like you chain spam Hibernate and it keeps chain casting Sonic Screech and it just stays there. That's one way to deal with it. Uh, it's a very cheesy way, but it's one way to deal with it. But it's important to note that I'm clearing every single trash in Crackmoss's room because you need all the space here in order to do the boss Crackmore that's in the middle of the room. And you can see Rotten Ball is something that we're making sure that we stop and we're kicking the decaying mine. It's really important, right? And the wave of decay from the rods, you just like let them channel. You can see it's going to explode here, the green stuff. Just let them channel. It's no big deal, right? Um, so I'm just going to fast forward here because the rest of the trash is actually kind of similar, right? You can see there's, again, blood swarmers and maggots. We pull the maggots, pull the blood swarmer, just make sure we keep them under control. Um, so nothing really happens here. I'm just going to forward the footage here. Um, yeah, you just want to... You can see... Oh, so, so let me just demonstrate here because that's where... Uh, you can see the tech that the druid is doing in action. You can see this blood swarmer is casting, screech, hibernate, stop by hibernate again, stop by hibernate again, and he keeps trying to chain cast, right? And the only time the druid basically stops is basically to run out because of the fixates. And look at this rotten bow, it's about to go off. See, nobody stops rotten bow. This is the first time we missed it in this dungeon, and basically it kills the warrior, right? It's a big cone. Just be very careful about the maggot, right? So I'm just going to forward here. You guys saw the danger here. Um, just, you know, just be careful of the maggot, right? Always call your stops. Um, the remaining part is this, like, it's just more blood swarmers and lashes, and you guys really know how to stop them, so I'm just gonna fast forward through the footage. Okay, so, over here, you guys can see before I pulled the lashes, there were five lashes, um, and I want all of them in my route, but the dangerous thing about pulling lashes is if you pull five lashes, you run out of kicks, where everyone will get stunned, because... You run out of kicks, everyone gets stunned one after another, one after another, and essentially that's a wipe. So just be careful about that, right? So you want to do maximum three uh, lashes, and just remember the lashes can be crowd control, right? So you can use various crowd controls to stop their decaying mine cast, right? But um, in my route, I do go for all five lashes. So I'm going to take the additional lashes here, as you guys can see, kill the lashes. And it's important at this point in time to track what your Bloodlust cooldown is because we use Bloodlust basically either in the first part of the dungeon, either on the boss, on the trash, it's up to you, right? Some people do a, a big pull off the bat and use Bloodlust at the start or you can use Bloodlust on the boss entirely, uh, I guess, personal preference. But you notice that we went past Crackmore, right? We didn't bother pulling Crackmore. Why? Because Crackmore is hands down one of the most dangerous threats in Underworld. And you don't want to fight Crackmore without Bloodlust. And I'll talk about why later on. But just remember, even on Fortified Tyrannical, regardless of which rotation it is, you want to use Bloodlust on Crackmore because he's dangerous. So this opening here after Crackmore's room, you run into a Death Speaker with three Guardians. The Guardians will basically do a cast where they put a shield up on themselves. The Death Speaker is actually the more dangerous one. So let's talk about it. So... Um, you can see the ability that is trying to cast here is called Wicked Frenzy. And so happens like the uh, Pharaoh Druid stunned him when he was trying to cast Wicked Frenzy. So the Guardians here are casting the Bone Shield on themselves, as you guys can see. You can see Wicked Frenzy attempted to being cast again. Now, Wicked Frenzy is basically a buff that is placed on one of the Guardians' um, you know, mobs here. And if it does go through, what it actually does is it puts... Um, a buff on the Guardian, such that when it swings at you, the tank, it places a dot on the tank. And it hurts quite a fair bit on very high keys, potentially one shotty. So, a few ways you can deal with it. Number one, uh, you can either dispel the dot from the tank, but just know that if the buff is still active on the mob, when it swings, it's still going to apply the dot. So that's not a permanent solution. By the way, the dot is reflectable by a spell warrior. So, with a uh, with a prop warrior, sorry. With a prop warrior, you might want to let the spell go through so you can reflect it. And then after that, you dispel the buff Wicked Frenzy from one of the Guardians. So that's one possible way. The other way is to basically stun the Wicked Frenzy when he's trying to attempt to cast. You can see Wicked Frenzy going on the Guardian and it's actually something that you can dispel via a Sooth. 
But as it basically melees me, you can see this debuff here. This is the dot I was talking about. Now on the 18, it kind of chunks me for a fair bit, right? Like 10, maybe, I will call it 10%, 15% per tick. But it's dispellable, right? And as long as the buff is on the Guardian, it'll keep reapplying uh, the dot. And you can see, I'm still tracking my Bloodlust debuff. There's still three minutes, so I'm taking my time. Let's talk about this horror here. This horror is arguably one of the more inefficient mobs to do in Underrod, but people still pull them anyway because you need the horror for count, else you won't get 100%. The horror does one ability, which is basically some form of Shadow Boat Volley, and you need to kick the horror. The good news is it can be stunned, it can be you know various forms of CC, right? So in the past in BFA, in coordinated groups, what people like to do is spawn the horror, um, CC the horror, and basically bring some other mobs onto the horror to cleave because the horror by itself is inefficient, right? You're just standing here hitting one mob and it's kind of a waste of time. But Death Bolt is the one that you want to kick. It's a very important cast. Uh, make sure you kick it, right? If it goes through, it basically does an AoE damage to everyone. So it's just dangerous. But you get the point. You can actually pull the Guardian uh, packs with the Death Speaker along with them. The Death Speaker will also, by the way, attempt to summon more Guardians um, other than casting Wicked Frenzy. So you can see Wicked Frenzy is on this Guardian here and it already has this dot on me, right? So um, just note that this Guardian can be removed in terms of the buff. You can see I'm getting chunked from the magical damage here. Um, just note that the Death Speaker will attempt to raise the Guardian. That's something that's interruptible, something that you should know. Anyway, just going to forward here. Uh, these Guardians are now all going to die. And checking the debuff time, I look at it and it's like, oh shit, there's still two minutes. Okay, cool. We are going to come back with Bloodlust as I type to the party. Uh, and we're heading to these two mobs. So let me talk about the Defilers here because this is a new mob here. The Defiler has three different types of kicks. And you really only need to kick two of them, right? So how I used to do it is I would assign markers to each of the Defilers. And you would say to the party members, all right, you are kicking the first on this mark and someone else kicks the second on this mark. Why? The first cast is Withering Curse. If you let Withering Curse go through, it basically is a curse that uh, reduces the damage that the group is able to do, I think by 10%, and it also increases the damage that the group takes. So Withering Curse is something that is not fatal, but it definitely slows you down by quite a bit. So that's the first thing to kick. The second one is actually the one that is way more dangerous because it's one shotty. So I'm just waiting for them to cast here and it should be casting here. Shadow Boat Volley. On high fortified, if this goes off, everyone dies. So make sure you kick the volley. It's a dangerous cast, right? So you can see what happened here. It went off on the plus 18. Everyone came down to 20% health, roughly. It's dangerous. So make sure you take note of that. Um, Shadow Boat Volley cast. Then the next ability, the third ability that is technically kickable if you're fast is basically the third ability, but you don't interrupt them because the Withering Curse and the Shadow Boat Volley is way more dangerous. But this Summon Spirit Drain Totem actually is deadly. Why? Because when it summons a Spirit Drain Totem, it, you can see this Summon Spirit Drain Totem, the cast was fast, right? Interruptible. But if you let it successfully cast, it will spawn this Totem they will start casting Spirit Drain, which is a long cast, right? You can see it's still channeling. You want to get the hell away from it because when it gets to max, it explodes and everything in its vicinity takes huge amounts of damage. So technically, you kick the Withering Curse, you kick the Volley, everything else you let through and you should be A-OK, -okay, right? Run away from the Totem. And you guys can see that my Bloodlust is coming back up on cooldown now. So I want to do Crack More, the next boss with Bloodlust. And Crackmore, um, let me just talk about its abilities as we do it in chronological order. There's a few cheese methods to do uh, Crackmore that I'll cover more in the one minute Mythic Plus videos in an organized group. You can see I'm doing a countdown for 15 seconds because I want to make sure that we have Bloodlust. So we put the boss, right? And instantly, um, you can see that we're tanking it in the open, which is kind of erroneous. In BFA, we used to tank it near the wall here, and you'll see why in a bit. The first ability he does is charge. And by the way, I believe the first ability he casts is either charge or indigestion. It, it flip-flops, right? It sometimes is charge, sometimes indigestion. Um, it's a 50-50 chance. However, after each ability charge or indigestion, 
it kind of rotates between the two, right? Charge, indigestion, then charge, then indigestion again. Um, but let's talk about the first ability. The first ability is called charge. And it leaves a wake of these like maggots on the ground that you need to run over to squish. And if you don't, they basically spawn a tick that obviously, you know, is very annoying and does additional damage to you, kind of dangerous. And you can see indigestion next here. Indigestion, if you're fast, technically avoidable. It's a frontal, so don't ever be in front of the boss. But you can technically leap away, or in my case, if I had my steed, I could have steed and just run away. And you can outrange this cast here so you don't take damage. But why I said that we were thanking it erroneously is because in BFA, I remember, and I remember after doing this key, that if you tank the boss near the edges here of the room, you can have all your melees and your range stand, let's say, here, right? And the tank basically tanks it outside, facing away from the bones. So when it does its charge, it charges into the wall and basically stops the charge. And that basically saves you quite a bit of melee uptime on the boss instead of letting it charge um, in the open here. You can see it always turns around to a random party member and charge, right? Imagine if they're baiting it towards the bones here, the walls here, the charge is gonna travel over a lesser distance and also don't be in its you know, path of the charge. You actually end up taking damage. But you definitely wanna squish all the little ticks that spawn. Now, next up, Tantrum. After a certain amount of time, it starts casting Tantrum. And this is AOE-wide unavoidable damage. On Tyrannical Keys, it does a lot of damage. And there will be a couple of Tantrums at least in your fight. So you wanna assign cooldowns. Like on the first Tantrum, everyone pop defensives. Second Tantrum, everyone relies on healer cooldowns. Third Tantrum, everyone health pot. Something like that. But it's important to assign Tantrums, right? And also assign which part of the rooms you will run around to pick up the ticks when he's doing Tantrum. Right, you can see it's all spread over. We didn't pre-assign, uh, but we managed to get them all. But it's really important that uh, maybe you drop some world markers and you assign where you're going to run off to. You can see indigestion coming through again. I tried to dodge it, uh, but I failed because you know I didn't get on my steed and run away. But you can dodge indigestion, by the way. And if you don't want to dodge indigestion, try and make sure that you have a defensive running. So charge is going through. Again, we're soaking. You guys can tell I'm a bit rusty in this dungeon because... It's been many years since I did Underwrought in BFA. And then finally, I remembered, oh shit, I should have taken it against the wall. So everyone can then bait the charge against the bones, but it's too late. It casts Tantrum, um, which I believe is still helpful because it keeps the initial ticks relatively near the wall. Um, but you, the idea is you want to pick them up, right? So there's two there that's not picked up. They're going to spawn ads. You can see they spawn the little ticks at the start of the dungeon, right? So anyway, uh, you kill the boss and everything else just dies. It's as simple as that. But Crack Mod Invested, definitely one of the most dangerous mods because of Tantrum. Number one, you don't squish everything um, and it spawns ticks. Number two, Tantrum itself does a lot of unavoidable AoE damage that is very deadly. So just be careful about that. So the next one is the boss again. This is Spore Caller Zencha. And let me just talk about what's happening on screen here. You can see all these green spell effects on the ground. They're basically sprouting mushrooms from the ground. And the idea is that the boss in each phase does two abilities. One is Shockwave, which is a frontal cono on the tank that will also destroy any mushrooms in the way. The other is Upheaval. It targets two non-tank members, places a marker on them, and when the marker and debuff expires, it will do an AoE around where the debuff expired, and that will kill the mushrooms as well. The objective is to clear all the mushrooms before the intermission of volatile pods. So I'll talk a bit more about that later on. But you can see what we're doing is, as a tank, it's always beneficial to bring Zencha out to the outskirts of the room. The mushrooms always spawn around this little platform. So it's always good to bring the boss outside, and then you point the shockwave as a tank towards the mushroom off to the side. And by the way, the shockwave does, you know, decent amount of damage. So as a tank, make sure you have mitigation. Um, it can kill you. So you can see the shockwave clearing some mushrooms here. Those are gone. It's way better to do it like um, approaching the mushrooms from the side like that rather than as a tank, you tank the boss in the middle and then you point the shockwave to the outside of the room because that way you clear less mushrooms, right? So just note that 
dragging the balls to the sides and pointing it to the sides of the mushroom, you clear way more. You can see upheaval is going out, right? They are standing near the mushrooms. And notice what happens when upheaval expires. There's this swirly indicator that goes out. And what that does is it actually, um, you know, destroys the mushroom. Just note the mushrooms here, they're destroyed, right? Mushrooms are gone. And the boss does volatile port, right? Alongside shockwave. Volatile port, you saw all those like uh, circles flying around. Yeah. Those, if you touch them, they give you one stack of disease. So uh, don't ever get touched by those orbs. Um, and it's important that we try and beat the clearing of all the mushrooms before festering harvest. And I think I misspoke earlier. You need to get to all the mushrooms cleared before festering harvest. And we'll talk about why. So you can see over here, uh, we have one more upheaval, right? It's our last upheaval. So it, it was important that they use the last upheaval to clear the remaining mushroom. So there's one mushroom here and you can see I'm running out to soak it. Why? Because when the boss casts Festering Harvest, every one available mushroom that is not cleared would basically apply a DZ stack onto your party members. And this stack of damage is called Decaying Spores. So just make sure that you clear all the mushrooms. Um, in a group comp that has immunities, uh, this boss is a lot easier. Why? Because I think you can see it in the next phase. You can actually use immunities to clear the mushrooms. Um, not to mention, you can also dispel um, the debuff you get when you run over the mushrooms. You guys can see like, see this thing, this debuff here? Yeah, I got it from running over the mushrooms. So anyway, you want to point the boss again inwards, right? So that it shock waves on the mushrooms, right? Shock waves, and I clear the mushroom manually here. I dodge all the volatile pots, the circles, and then I move the boss over again to cleave inwards. So that also is a sign that these two people need to run outside uh, to drop the, you know, the markers. And dropping there is a bit unfortunate because you're destroying the, the mushrooms here that I could have shocked with, right? So clearly we lack chemistry. And look at what's happening next. We have festering harvest and all these mushrooms that's left untouched. If I don't soak them, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. 11 stacks of decays, which is an instant death. So I need to run uh, across all of them and immediately basically pop bubble. You can see I pop bubble here, I bubble torn the boss. And if I didn't do that, we will have way more stacks. Um, and that's how you die, right? So this boss isn't hard, but it requires a bit of awareness from the tank and the DPS as well. So if you have a rope, by the way, you can actually shroud past all these things towards the end of the dungeon. Uh, but we don't have a rope, so I'm going to show you a non-rope route. Uh, I drop down, right? So just to recap, after the boss, I come down the stairs and you can jump up this ledge here. Down the stairs, jump up this ledge and you can creep towards this worm here, right? You know this is a worm because of the, um, you know, blood like cloud thing on the ground. And again, you have a horror. Um, some people like to pull the horror with the defiler here. If your group is good, you can. Because remember, like I said, the defiler has really only two casts that you need to kick and you just need to run away from the drain totem. Anyway, I put the defiler by itself, which um, it's a very safe play. You don't need to do this. Um, and you can actually play the defiler with other mobs if you want to be more efficient. But I was just being really safe, so I'm going to forward this uh, bit. After the defiler, you can see this middle platform here. This middle platform consists of guardians and again, uh, basically the mob that you need to kick uh, when it tries to summon additional guardians, which is the death speaker and which is the, also the mob that does Wicked Frenzy, right? So you can see it attempted to cast Raise Dead and I interrupted it. If Raise Dead goes through, it summons another Guardian, right? And then it's going to cast Wicked Frenzy. You can see Wicked Frenzy going through. Uh, we hodged it to stop it from casting. Uh, but Wicked Frenzy does go through. So it's now on this Guardian. He meleeed me. Look at this dot. So I'm taking damage now from the dot, which can be dispelled, by the way. Anyway, you clear them all. Um, and then the next part here, you want to head towards the end of the dungeon, which is over here. But you can't just run in a straight line because there's the Corruptor, there's Worms here, and you can see my count is 95.24 already. I don't need a lot of count, right? So to get perfect count, I need to stealth past this Corruptor. I don't want this Corruptor, right? So, and I'll talk about the Corruptor mob. I know it's new to you, but don't you worry. We're going to cover the Corruptor shortly. I'm just going to show you how I skipped. So those who invis obviously went on ahead first. I wait for the Corruptor to pad all the way left. I basically hug right here, right? And I jump up this ledge here and I very carefully hug to the right. 
Why? Because if you don't hug to the right, you see this like bubbling clouds here, they will spawn the worm. And this is also a possible source of wipe. People always butt pull the worms because they can't see the worms. But if you butt pull the worms, nobody kicks the volley, you are in trouble, the death bolt. So hug right here and you wouldn't pull the worms, which leaves you open to just these two corruptors that mix up the remaining, as you guys can see, exact perfect call, 4.76%, which gives you 100%. So these corruptors, they do two abilities. The first ability is Abyssal Reach. And when Abyssal Reach goes through, what it does is it summons a tentacle that is going to slam on the player spot that it was occupying when the cast went through. So just to recap, Abyssal Reach, for each player, it spawns one of these blue-purple tentacles. And the blue-purple tentacles will slam where the players was when they spawn. So the idea is that you want to bait all the Abyssal Reach tentacles on maybe one area of the room. Then you move to the open area of the room. Like, like you can see what I'm doing here. There's no Abyssal Reach tentacles here, right? So that's how I stay safe away from the tentacles here. The Corruptors also will cast Maddening Gaze, which is a frontal, a very long traveling frontal, a straight line. If you get hit by this on high fortified, you die, one shot. If you don't, like you survive somehow on low keys, it fears you. So just take note of that, right? So you can see he suddenly turns around and he starts channeling Maddening Gaze. So you need to watch where they're facing. In this case, they're both facing the, the gate here, right? So the frontal will be this line. So whoever is this guy, he's gonna get one shot here, you can see. Um, he barely dodges it, which is great. But again, then they cycle back to Abyssal Reach, which is the purple tentacles. Then we move it to the other side again, and we wait for the next uh, Maddening Gaze. You can see like this guy, if he stands in this path, he's going to get hit by Maddening Gaze. I don't know if he does, but you can see uh, the Shammy dies instantly from Maddening Gaze, right? No chance given. And then it's back to Abyssal Reach again. And I just make it a point to like kind of move far away from the original Abyssal Reach. I'm very careful to see where it's pointing Maddening Gaze is facing the gate and facing that direction. Um, so if you're ranged, you probably want to play far so you have time to react uh, to Maddening Gaze. But that's essentially the Corruptor mobs. And with that, you probably have seen all the mobs. Um, and once you have gotten to 100%, this NPC will come and open the gate to the very final bit of the boss. Once the RP goes through, it will suck you down uh, when you enter um, you know, this little area here, it sucks you down into the bottom to fight the final boss. And this boss actually, a lot of people use to struggle with it in BFA, but there's a strategy that everyone pretty much figured out how to do in Pucks eventually in BFA that is very safe that I'm going to reiterate for you guys. So take note of what I'm doing here. I'm pulling the boss towards the outer ring, right? And we'll talk about, you know, what happens if you're not in the outer ring, um, later on, right? So uh, you pull the boss, right, to the outer ring, or you can be even closer to the inner ring that's possible. But the idea is that where you are as a tank, you want your party members to stack on you, right? So they're stacking on me, and I'm just waiting for him to cast something called Vowel Expulsion. The moment you see him cast Vowel Expulsion, you want to walk in between his legs here, across to the other side of his model. Why? Because Vowel Expulsion is basically kind of like a frontal vomit and you know it can't turn around and you know vomit on where its back was facing so when you're on its back it's safe right um, so that's just something to take note of you then turn the boss around again after you walk through the legs and again you're lining up everyone to walk through the legs so you wait for it to cast Val expulsion walk through the legs again and again you're safe right so if you're slow to move you will still take damage. So just remember, turn around, face the boss, and, and run through the legs again. You can see that the boss is actually not taking damage throughout the fight. It just, you know, absorbs damage. This is normal, by the way. The point is you need to keep hitting this abomination so that it will spawn the visages. The visages spawn depending on, you know, the uh, encounter and, and how long the encounter has been going on for. But the idea is that you always DPS the abomination you don't need to DPS the visage, even though that's the objective of how to kill the boss. Because this NPC here in the middle, he will help you kill the visages. You can see, um, you know, we move through the legs again, right? And he vomits. And you can see that it says, add killed five remaining. So I need to kill five more ads for the boss to basically die. 
And you can see as the ads start dying, the visages start dying, the boss actually takes a significant amount of damage, right? From 80 plus percent to 65 percent. So that's how you kill the boss. Um, anyway, you turn the boss around again and you want to move through the legs or move through the sides also possible. Make sure you're always on the back. You can see the warrior didn't move in time. So he got vomited on, almost died. And you'll notice that throughout the encounter, there are spores that travels towards you. And these spores, when you come in contact with them or you pop them, from AOE damage, they only have like one health or something like that. If you pop them, they will spawn like this, this goo on the ground, which you don't want to uh, basically interfere with what you're doing, right? So um, you can see that we are again waiting for um, him to do this for expulsion. Also note that as they touch my consecration, they kind of explode the little spores, they explode and form a goo. Yep, you always want to try and keep to this little outside part of the room, right? Don't want to venture too far to the frontier sides of the room because I've seen spores spawn in that area and it one-shots people because, you know, you are unaware. And it's a bit of RNG. That's the shitty thing about this boss. If you stand on the outside, the spores might literally spawn on you and you don't have time to react and you just die. Like I've seen it happen. It's rare, but it happens. So try and keep towards like this outside ring here you know you want to try and keep closer towards the inner ring that's what i'm trying to say anyway uh, you can see that this npc does this purge protocols engage and starting to chunk the visage visage dies right and you keep on hitting the boss so again reposition the boss rotate inwards wait for him to cast his uh, vile expulsion and then you walk through the legs right so it's a rinse and repeat fight from here onwards as long as you're able to control the space um, of all these goo you'll be okay, right? So turn the boss again around. And I know that it's probably like the final, final research uh, that we need to fight. Uh, this cleansing light also helps. It removes the debuff that everyone has. I wouldn't go into too much detail about that. Just know that if you have cleansing light, just stack with everyone, right? Because this strat is predicated on uh, people stacking together, essentially. Just to kind of explain to you, this cleansing light basically puts an aura around someone, right? One of us, uh, the players will get cleansing light and uh, you guys might have already seen it in this video when you get a cleansing light you have a circle appearing uh, near you and let me rewind because we killed the boss here you can see this cleansing light what it does is you can see this this debuff here this debuff here is called putrid blood and putrid blood is a stacking magical damage over time the only way to get rid of this putrid blood is you need to be standing in this glowy circle that is um basically something that the boss cast on one of the players called Cleansing Light. And actually, no, it's actually the Titan Keeper, the NPC, friendly NPC that does Cleansing Light. It's once the light AOE expires, you can see the debuff drops off, right? So you always want to be stacked up, move through legs, stacked up, move through legs. And that way you automatically um, is able to, number one, control where the vomits are. Number two, you also get to cleanse um, yourself of debuffs um, in a manner that, you know, is friendly, right? That's easy. And with that, it basically, you know, it's the entire dungeon, right? And hopefully, you know, in this video, through explaining everything, both the mobs and the bosses, you will now feel very confident in terms of tackling this dungeon on both Fortified and Tyrannical. Um, and if you found this masterclass helpful, you know, just be rest assured that the rest of Dragonflight Season 2 masterclasses are on this channel. Eventually, you can find them all. And depends on when you're watching this, it might already be all out. Um, and if these masterclasses are helpful to you, do subscribe to the channel because more Dragonflight Mythic Plus Season 2 content is coming your way, including those one-minute tips. You do not want to miss that. I also stream on Twitch. Feel free to swing by to hang out. Good luck in your keystones. I will see you soon.